need to spray, and that could be zero. What do I need to spray? Or pardon me, when and what? We'll talk about those. So cultural practices, sanitation is basically the foundation for naval orange worm management in the arms. I mean, without it, you're fighting a real uphill battle, period. Now, you can do excellent sanitation, but of course, too, it depends on what your, your neighbor does. So you've got to kind of say, hey, neighbor. Mm -hmm. And think about, think about this. With the increase, yeah. With the increase, everybody's listening. With the increase in uh, minimum wage, what's that going to do to sanitation? You know, right? It's gonna it, it's gonna drop down, and that that is critical. That is a critical factor. Unless we figure out some smart engineer gets out there and figures out how to knock all those things off the tree and and, and get them onto the ground and chop them up. And let's talk about that right now. So, naval orange worm. Next page, page three. Naval orange worm overwinters as late in star larvae in those months. And when you're doing cultural practices, you're not them off, and basically you're eliminating that population. You're getting way ahead of the curve. <clears throat> so you can remove them by, by shaking, by polling, and passive. Of course, there's the rain that helps. Uh, the polling, which is gonna get a lot more expensive. And um, uh, passive also is like rows and various things like that, and then shaking. So you wanna get them on the ground, Wind roll them and uh, flail them. Now in, in pistachios, that's a whole nother ball of wax. It's like I've heard it's like uh, mowing marbles. Now we can do we can do it in in almonds pretty well. We can flail mow them, get those into the centers, and flail mow them, and or disc them. And you better disc them deep because those larvae can escape through them. Right. The goal is. Yeah, I got it right here, but the goal is how many mommies per tree in this area? One for every three or something. Point. Yeah. How do you know? Point, point two mommies per tree. That's pretty, that's pretty low. An eight on the ground, that's low. Now, it's more than that when you go north because what? They get more rain. They so that is really the foundation of naval orange worm control management let's say so now let's let's move on let's uh let's just talk a little bit about the seasonal development are you all familiar with really the seasonal development of naval orange so what you have flights and those bullet points are followed by first second third and fourth those are flights not generations so you get that overwintering overwintering generation but the first flight and those come out in March, and this is kind of the, the main, because, it, because you can put pheromone traps out and start getting captures in January, because they kind of just trickle up. But the bulk of the flight occurs from March to May, and it's, what, it's three months over a long period of time. Those, those adults, those females that are coming out that are mating, where are they laying their eggs? Mumps. They're back on the mummies. So if you got a lot of mummies out there, boom, that's that's fodder. That's that's where they're that's where they're going back to. That crop is not on them, your crop. However, that second flight from June to July, depending on when that hole split occurs and the relationship of when those really start peaking up there, they're laying eggs on the, the bulk of the new crop. That's, that's where we got to concentrate our, our efforts to, to minimize the damage right there. Those mummies, uh, there's some management practices that say, hey, we're going we're gonna to nip those populations in the bud and we're going we're gonna to spray in May. But I'll show you a little bit later, in, in my opinion, and, and David Havlin, who is just the, it's like a quintessential farm advisor. The god. He's god. He's god. <laughs> the guy is the god of farm advising. When I have a question, who do I ask? I call up god. <laughs> Small g. Small g. Small g. And David. David Hatton. 
No, I'm, I'm sorry. I admired the guy a lot. He is very, very knowledgeable. He's very confident of himself, but uh, he's, he is very knowledgeable. Let's talk about degree days. So 1050 to 6 degree days, right? So that's the time from A to A. Remember that. But that changes as the food quality changes. When those, if they're on, if they're on a new crop, it can see like uh, you can see it's what 300, 356 degree days fewer if if they're on new on the new crop. But we don't when we're when we're when we're using degree days to time our our insecticide sprays. We don't really use. The, the lesser of that. We, we, we stick to 1056. And look at pistachio. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, don't eat pistachios because it only takes five to 600 degree days for an able orange worm to fully develop on a pistachio. That tells you something. I thought I would get more laughs on that one. But. <laughs> okay, so you'll notice now I have some figures. But I want you to skip over that because I'm a, I'm quite a, a I can talk a lot, and uh, I would be happy to talk to anybody. And if I have time, uh, at the end, uh, or during the talk, or after the after the after the meeting, about these figures and what how we how we came about this. And this is really the relationship between eggs, egg captures, and male moth captures. Because the big question is, what do, what do pheromone traps mean? We've had them now for what three years, something like that. What what do they mean? We've got a, a big meeting on 14th of November, uh, and and that's going to be an important. It's the the big the big researchers there, USDA guys, and then I myself will uh, will say a few words. Okay, just some FYI stuff on this. Money. So turn to page six. I don't know if I said that. Go to page six. We're going to skip those figures. We'll go back to them. And I feel some raindrops, so I better keep moving. So, so um, when we when we talk about you know pheromone traps and uh, and egg traps, egg traps and the use of pheromones that that started a long time ago, basically in the 70s. Dick Rice, who was another god. Uh, uh, Developed that egg trap back in 1973. Figured, well, you know, I'll just put a fake mummy out there. And the objective of the egg traps is really not to tell how much, how many moths that you have out there necessarily, but uh, when egg deposition begins. Biofilms, and I'll mention that again in a little bit later. So I'm be repeating myself here. Male, male activity, and I said again, Dick Rice. Uh, used virgin females, but now we have what the, sex, the synthetic sex pheromone that uh, that does the same thing. And you look at all the data from Dick Rice and, and Brad Higby and all of the people that are, you know, uh, have have used virgin females for for a long time. And the pheromone traps and or the the synthetic pheromone and the virgin females really give us very very similar data. That said, with all of those data, we still don't have a real clear relationship between eggs and uh, male moth capture. So the tools basically, and I've said this uh, before, egg traps. We use egg traps if they've been around for long, for a long time. We use those to establish biofix. And then we start accumulating degree days from biofix. And what is that? 1056. And that's when that first the, those, those females that have come out of, of uh, those mummies, and now they're going to start laying eggs on the, uh, on the new crop, on the, on the, the, the vulnerable crop, the one you want to protect. So we have the sex pheromones. It basically is to show the periods of, of male moth flight. I have male moth flight there, but actually the, the flights. So they, they don't... I think there are pretty much real distinct generations of, of, of uh, navel orange worm. Um, I think Joel Siegel, you, a lot of you may know him, he doesn't think so, but he works primarily in pistachios. But we see it really quite clearly 
in almonds. So could, can we establish, and I don't know if any of you thought about this, that use the pheromone traps. Can we use pheromone traps to establish a biofix? Has anyone tried that or think about that? The answer is, I don't think so. I don't think we can do it. There's not a good enough relationship there. So, hence, egg traps are still the, 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 main, the main tool there. And in conjunction with pheromone traps, now we have some tools to really monitor, uh, to monitor those flights. We did a study, uh, again, it's, I'm gonna show you some data, uh, and it, we did a study in 2014 and 2015. We had a, so, a total of 32 sites, not all different sites, but 32 sites between the two years. Lots and lots of data, like 12 traps out there. And we set them up, egg trap, egg trap, pheromone trap, egg trap, egg trap. That was one set. And we had three of those sets uh, at each site. So lots and lots of data. And we were trying to find that relationship between egg capture and male moth capture. So the rest of the experimental design is not fixed. Just what I said is the important, the important takeaway message from it. So if you're using egg traps, how, how uh, consistent are they in, in uh, determining biofits from the way northern parts of, of California, and those growing regions up in Butte and, and this, in the Kern County? Well, here are some data that show unbelievably close. I mean, it really, really is. They're really very, very close. That first column is the county. The second column is the date of egg biofix. So you put egg traps out quite early in the season, and you can see when we consistently started capturing eggs. And look at the consistency. My gosh, all, you know, right in there, April, mid-April. Now there's a couple little outliers, but, you know, unbelievably close. Very, very accurate. And the weeks, that's not so important. And then the number of male moths captured per week at Biofix. And that is, if you'll notice, all but four sites in 2014, and I'll show you 2015 in just a minute, all but 14 sites had male moth captures above 10, at least above 10. So. That's, that's, that's a tentative relationship right there. You're capturing male moths, that gives you a pretty good idea that you're also gonna be capturing males. I mean, uh, eggs as well. 2015, let's not go over that. Uh, it's starting to rain, so I'm gonna just keep moving here. It's the same kind of data. Now that the, uh, the, the biofix dates are a little bit more spread out. They're in, in, uh, in March, but we had some real warm weather in March that I think sped things up. So egg traps, very, very consistent across, uh, across the growing regions of California. Okay, so now we come to where the rubber meets the road. It's how many sprays do I need? You, you, you might need zero, but most of the time, you're going to need a spray to control navel orange. Okay? So we talked about the development or the flights. Now let's look at when the most important time to put on an application of an insecticide is in almonds. So I've got this, this timing is, at the, is the, first, uh, the first column, and then priority is the second one and really the objective and then some comments. And this is from God himself, David Havlin, small g. Uh, <laughs> okay, take a look at that. So we'll just go at the top, okay? Some of those guys are looking at the top. The first flight, late May. That's priority number three. That's not really, in my opinion and David's opinion, not very important. 
that's when those 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 uh, navel orange worm are laying eggs on what? on mummies. So you might have very very few mummies out there. Then they'll move, right? So that's third priority. So then I don't see really that there's an orchard around that doesn't need. Uh, a spray at hull split, and so that's the that's the first priority of your naval orange worm <coughs> management uh, program is a spray at hull split, and that's what June-ish to late, late June, depending on quite where you are, but July, right? So that's the second generation or second flight of females coming out, and they're laying eggs on those splitting nuts, right? prevent those second flight eggs from deposition on the bulk of the new crop. Primary, tom primary, primary timing in almonds uh, can be used in pistachios uh, if the crop or if the pressure is very, very high and it's starting to rain. Okay, on, on the next page, I have some information and how it relates, how that same kind of information relates but to pistachios. And let's, let's not spend the time right there. You can look at that. And I'd be happy to talk to you after, after the talk. You want an umbrella? Oh, yeah. That'll help me a little bit. <laughs> OK. So now what do you need to spray? And that, that question really is between a grower and a pest control advisor or manager. Because there's a lot of really, really effective, good products out there. But there is a real big caution. In 2006, pyrethroids came out, generic pyrethroids, and they were, bar none, extremely effective. But there is resistance, undoubtedly, be, uh, developing, and especially in the Kern, in Kern County. So be very, very careful if you're going to choose a pyrethroid. I know they're inexpensive. They are still effective. But, you know, think about it. There is some mite, some mite issues that can occur. So, so think about that, okay? Intrepid, the foxyphenazide, very good product. Get it on before those eggs are deposited. Before the eggs are deposited. Altacor, again, corn trinilaprol, an exceptionally good product, and uh, in trust and delicate. Now, those, those choices, those are economic choices, and between you and, or between a PCA and, and the grower. Okay? I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but I don't think I really have to. I don't, personally don't have a lot of data on the efficacy of those products. But Dave, or uh, Brad Higby, if you ever see him speaking, he has done a truckload of talks on the efficacy of various products. Okay, and I think, pardon me, it's getting wet here. Oh, I want to talk just one more quick thing here. Mating disruption. Does anybody here use mating disruption? Yeah. Okay, it is, it's for real. It really, really works. And, and there's, now there's a, few, there's a few different products out there and they range in what they do and what they offer. But, but the mating disruption itself is extremely effective. But you have to remember that at least in the beginning, a, a, a mating disruption program is done in conjunction with prudent insecticide use as well. So don't think you're going to just go out there and put mating disruption out and boom, bada, boom, you're going to you know, be, you know, have lower impacts or save a bunch of money. It's going to take some management and uh, some, some money in the beginning. Yeah, I got generally used. Okay, I think that'll do it. I don't know how much time I, I, I used up, probably around 25 minutes. 15 minutes? Uh, it's 10.30, I don't remember when you started. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? Do you, do you Shoot, we got, I, I, I did this intentionally because I, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. <laughs> any questions? Right here. I got a question. Yeah. So on your sides where you were looking at your trap data, yeah. I was also 